Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's Inside Seminar Series. My name is Jeff. I'm the director here. It's my great pleasure in welcoming you. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land of which we gather today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander who might be joining us in person or in webinar land today. Uh, as the title suggests, we have our very own Cameron Francis here talking about his first-hand experience of pill testing at the UK Boomtown Festival as part of The Loop. Uh, I'd like to just quickly play a little video about The Loop just to set the scene. The 700 people in this Bristol nightclub appear without a care in the world, but they are very vulnerable. Drugs in the UK are stronger than ever, stronger than they realise. Thank you very much. Motion nightclub uses sniffer dogs to turn people with drugs away. I have to go back there, buddy. But still, in November of last year, one 19-year-old died after taking ecstasy here. One of Motion's founders thinks enough is enough. We're seeing more people end up in um, medical rooms, we're seeing more people go to hospital and we're hearing more people dying. So for Bristol, part of the solution is testing. This weekend, ITV News was given exclusive access to the first ever drugs test in a UK city centre. What we're interested in here is being able to give them a guide to say, look, this tablet is crazy strong, you really need to be careful. Crucially, this pop-up lab is supported by the police and the council. Members of the public bring their illegal drugs here for testing by chemists. So for the MDMA, uh, did you taste it? Most of the samples are MDMA, a form of ecstasy. The strength of the drugs they find surprises even the experts. Wow. Wow. Wow what? This is a high purity sample. Could it kill? The diplomatic answer is yes. This man brought hallucinogenic drugs in for testing. What do you hope this service will do for you? Give me some clarity as to what I'm putting into my body. Because uh, it's good to know that. Yeah. All the drugs handed in are destroyed after testing. Nothing we discussed today shall be seen by you as a loop or the event encouraging you to take drugs off. To and when they get the results, users must have a consultation to talk about their drug habits. Well, what about the risks involved in negative experiences? You know? I made some mistakes and I, I, um, I experienced the, the, the dark side of it. Yes. Critics may claim this programme promotes drug use, but the organiser is clear. No drug use is safe. When we talk to drug users, we say to them that the safest way to take drugs is not to take them at all. However, this is a pragmatic harm reduction service, so we accept that some people may take drugs uh, and we need to identify what's in circulation. The fact that police are allowing this to happen may come as a surprise, but in the fight against drug deaths, they say they need new ideas. But there's a bigger picture when it comes to the use of drugs. Um, there's smaller uses of drugs, very low level possession, um, which can sometimes take quite a lot of time in terms of police officers dealing with them, rather than carrying on with um, tactics that have been tried for many years and haven't necessarily always had the greatest impact. It, it's time to try new things and look at different ways of doing things. Um, so that's um, an excellent overview of how it's all come about and how it works. So now it's Uncle Cammy's holiday slideshow. Um, I'm going to take you through some photos of um, Boomtown and I want to tell you a little bit about how the intervention worked uh, from my perspective. So I was recently on holidays and I'd met Fiona when she was here earlier this year and got in touch and said I'd like to volunteer. So um, yeah, Boomtown Fair is, uh, as Fiona mentioned, is the largest of the uh, festivals that uh, the Loop is running front of house testing from. Um, and so I'll just kind of take you through it. It's a massive festival, about 60,000 people. It goes over about five days. Um, where's my... There we go. Oh, I don't see that. Yeah, this, um, this map is not to scale. It's the worst <laughs> festival map ever. Uh, but it, uh, it was actually about three hours walk from the gate to our campsite when we arrived. Uh, so it's enormous and it would take me 40 minutes to walk to the loop every morning for my shift. Uh, so the scale is kind of enormous. Uh, it's hard to put it. it uh, from an Australian perspective, given the festivals we have here, I just kept on saying I can't believe it every time I went over a hill. Uh, it, it keeps going. Um, so the scale is kind of enormous. and. I think another difference that I noticed, and Fiona mentioned that the festivals have all got a bit of a different drug culture and Boomtown being one of the heavier, um, is that, yeah, can confirm heavy drug using culture. 
uh, different to an Australian festival as well. With uh, So firstly, there's a really heavy policing presence at Boomtown. Um, every bag was searched on the way in and there were sniffer dogs on every single entrance. And the sniffer dogs ran continuously the whole time. Uh, so if the police dogs weren't working, there was private security had their own sniffer dogs as well. Um, we also had our bags searched, like our suitcases unpacked and searched really thoroughly as well, which is actually a higher level of um, policing than what we see at some of our Australian festivals that might have sniffer dogs, but still not really searching everybody. So in terms of how the policing works externally, there's nothing different to any other festival. Um, having said that though, it really didn't stop the drugs. Uh, you know, even a drug like N-ethylpentylone, it's too new for the dogs to have been trained to sniff it. It's as simple as that. So uh, they just can't detect some of those new drugs. But um, yeah, that's what the festival kind of looks like. Uh, this is the opening ceremony. Let me just get you my notes. Uh, this is um, this is actually right outside the Loops testing service, and I thought I missed that part where they were all lining up to come in. Uh, but this was actually right as the festival was opening. So the uh, the loop was located in the main drag, which is like a really central part of the festival and extremely well signed. So you could sort of see it for miles and it's located in a, uh, the main drag has got uh, the loop safety testing. Uh, one side directly next door is welfare and directly next door to that is medical. And they're all kind of integrated out the back. So if we identified somebody that was having difficulties, we could just move them next door and they'd be sort of triaged in the welfare area and then moved over to medical if they needed a medical intervention. So a really seamless kind of um, movement of punters across the back. And also, as Fiona mentioned, like medical and welfare would pop in occasionally and ask us drug questions as well. Like they were getting... Um, Oh, one of the welfare guys came over because a young fella had just snorted two big... Uh, no, so he didn't snort them. He'd orally taken two big lines of 2CB and they weren't sure, like, is that a lot? So yes, can confirm that was a lot of 2CB. Um, and he, I think he thought it was some other drug, so he'd taken a huge dose. And we were able to sort of talk to the medical and welfare people about what to expect. He'd only just taken that and to get them up to speed on uh, what he might be about to go through. Uh, this is a photograph from outside. I didn't take any photos of uh, the service while it's active because we've got a whole bunch of people, service users, who we don't want in our photos. But um, a very nice large uh, space. And here's a little map. I've got Nile made us this beautiful little floor plan. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. So people would come in from where it says festival up there. They'd wander in and they'd drop a sample off at the sample drop off table, which was staffed by chemists. Uh, they'd be asked to put pop a bit of their sample, either a powder or a tablet, into a little clippy bag. Uh, they'd be given a raffle ticket, very low-tech system. <laughs> they'd be given a raffle ticket, asked to photograph it so they don't lose them. Uh, then the sample is popped into a larger bag with the raffle, another raffle ticket and a tiny little questionnaire that asks the person what do they think it was and have they consumed any of that so far and have they had any medical concerns about it. They're then uh, asked that it's then no loop staff touch any drugs at this point. The service user must handle all of the product uh, and so they have to be coached quite carefully in how to do that. Uh, and then it's dropped into a locked letterbox, which is basically chained up on the counter. And then every couple of hours, the letterbox is taken out the back uh, and the chemists start working through all of the different samples. So as Fiona mentioned that often, uh, our wait time was about an hour for a lot of people. So it's a multi-day festival. Uh, our biggest day was probably the Saturday. So people had sort of maybe bought drugs and were planning to take them. So uh, they'd be asked to come back in about an hour or so. Um, some people would come back the next day. Uh, but generally an hour was about how quickly we could do it. So they'd drop them off. Once they come back, they rock up to the sample result table with their raffle ticket. And one of the chemists looks up the number on a database and uh, they would then, the chemist would then see the result that they've got and they would then pass that result to a harm reduction uh, worker like myself and we would take the result and the person through to a little consultation booth uh, and you can see the little booths there. I think when it was uh, totally going off, we had 12 different results booths going at the same time. Uh, that was, yeah, that was bulk uh, and we still had a lineup out the door as well. Um, it, it was a tricky one once it became busy. Uh, we obviously don't want to trade off on the quality of the intervention, basically, as it becomes busy. So our line was that actually we'd rather do a good job than have to rush it and push people through. So uh, we, yeah, there was a few discussions about the logistics of how do you manage large crowds uh, in that sort of context. Oh, this is the beautiful team. This is everybody on the last day looking all very shiny and weary. Uh, we were all losing our voices pretty much by that stage because uh, it's non-stop talking. 
uh, the service would open at 12 p.m. and we'd have a queue at 12 p.m. ready for opening and it would close at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, there'd usually be a few service users still in there though, so it'd be about 8.30 at night, it would be about the time that we'd finish. So my days would start about 11 a.m., we'd have a little team briefing, uh, we'd start with a little workshop. Um, each morning we had a great little team leader, uh, Lily, who's an awesome team leader, we'd start our little our day with a discussion about a different drug and each day we'd do a different drug and just have a quick workshop on what are our messages on cocaine and what are our top five harm reduction strategies. We'd all workshop that each day, so a little professional development. Uh, we'd also get a briefing from chemists on anything unusual that had come through the day before. Uh, there was quite a few unusual things coming through which we all needed a bit of discussion about, like there had been some malaria drugs identified which can have a whole range of side effects, for, and this is not my area. I, I know illicit drugs, but don't know malaria drugs. Uh, so we had to do a bit of a bit of homework on that stuff, and everyone had a bit, a bit of a discussion around if we get that result, what are we sort of telling people about that? So that was sort of how the days would be structured. Uh, this is like some signage to try and help people know how much uh, pill or powder to pop into the bag, the instructions. Uh, this got pretty crazy because there was a lot of people around at certain times. It was really hard to keep up with. We also found, and I found interesting from an Australian perspective, that just so you know, the price of drugs in the UK is way cheaper than here, if you don't know that. Um, people were paying about 10 or 15 pounds for three pills. And in Australia, I mean, people are paying 25 to 30 dollars a tablet. Um, we did find a lot of punters reluctant to give a whole tablet over for testing and only wanted to give tiny little amounts. And I was a bit surprised about that coming from Australia. I just assumed that, you know, they're so cheap there. Uh, just donate a whole tablet. But some people were a bit reluctant too. Now, sort of as the days went on, that became more reluctant because they were running out of drugs and so didn't want to offer up a whole tablet. Um, we, in the end, stopped taking partial tablet samples because uh, we can't give someone a dosage on that. And oh, as Fiona mentioned, dosage was one of the most important harm reduction messages that we had to have with people. We also found punters would come in with a partial tablet and we'd give them the result and say, I can't tell you how much was in there. And they'd be like, oh, why not? Anyway, they were told in advance, but they still expected that. I know surely you can sort of guess whatever, but um, we weren't really able to do that. Uh, this is a photograph uh, off Twitter. This is some of the samples bagged up and or ready for testing with the little numbers in them. Uh, this is the chemist sweatshop out the back. <laughs> <laughs> They were working very hard uh, at the bag. I think they were there till midnight most nights. Um, Chemist Disneyland, though, they yeah. loved it. Like, <laughs> they really loved it. And I think the challenge for them in getting a strange sample of something and having to work out what it is was, to them, really exciting. And they genuinely enjoyed it, as did all of us harm reduction people as well. So we were all having so much fun. Uh, but yeah, this was a, a donger out the back. Um, obviously, it's a you know the festival was quite cold. It was raining, yay UK summer. Uh, it, the conditions in the tent were at times pretty full on. There was some really heavy rain, uh, so it's you know the chemists need to be in a nice contained environment with the, the machinery all protected out the back. Um, and this is a result there. Fiona sh showed you some of that as well. Uh, these are some tickets, so these are the ticket results which the chemist would pass on to us uh, to give to the person and the, what, if it was a powdered sample that have a three point scale of purity, uh, so level one would be a one to 33 percent purity, level two 33 to 66, or level three 66 to 99 percent purity, so we could give people a gauge of purity of a powder and otherwise if they gave us a whole tablet we could give them an actual dosage which was accurate to within 20 or so milligrams. Um, so with the tickets, uh, people are not allowed to take photos of tickets. A lot of, a lot of the punters wanted to take a photograph or take the ticket away, uh, which they're not allowed to do because we don't want to provide people with like a see the loop says my drugs are awesome uh, kind of response. It's a, it's a brief intervention that's delivered in context to a person uh, in that setting. So it's not designed for people to you know, take away. Punters are pretty good once we sort of explain that to them, but that's what, uh, we, would be, that's what we would be given with our result. So I just wanted to give you, I thought I'd just tell you a couple of stories about a couple of interesting uh, cases that came through for me. And I don't know why I had every single day, my last case of the day was like a doozy, uh, <laughs> which I don't know why that happened. It, it was, the brief intervention that we do is really, I thought, ingenious. It's a little bit, a lot of you have probably worked in needle and syringe programs or familiar with how an SP works. Um, this intervention is not that different. It's a little bit expanded. So we would start, when the person comes in and I sit them down, I'd start by asking, asking them basic, basic demographics to commence, and then we'd ask them about how, how much alcohol have you had to consume today. 
because obviously it's a festival, everyone's drinking, and we do have to me work out their level of intoxication. How are, how are able are they to take on board what we're talking about? So we do quite an accurate alcohol uh, uh, assessment of how much they've consumed today. We then ask them about uh, other substance, uh, other prescription medication they might be on, any over-the-counter medication. We then do a whole drug use history uh, where we'd ask them about er all the drugs that they've ever taken in their life and how recently have they done that, last day, last week, last month, last year, or ever. And then we'd ask them, are you intending on using that substance while you're here at the festival? We hold the result and keep it secret through all of that time and tension builds and the people are like, oh, give me the roll. Um, the reason that we hold that result though is because I'm trying to get all of this context around how that result has been delivered. So by the time I can tell them that this is what your tablet has in it, I know all the drug, I know their drug use history, I know how experienced they are, I've got a sense of how much they know about drugs uh, and I know what else they're going to take. So if I've got an MDMA sample, I know that they told me they're also taking cocaine and they're gonna take some ketamine and they're gonna do this and that. So that result I'm giving them is done in context of all those other drugs. And so for, that's why I found it such a great little intervention because uh, it really did give us a whole lot of information. Uh, and I think one of the things I found a little frustrating watching the news for the last couple of days is this, um, a lot of people have a misconception about how testing services work, that we're doing a pass or a fail test. That we go, this is a good one oh, that's a bad one, it is not the case at all. Everybody is read a disclaimer, everybody is told no drug use is safe. As just like in an NSP, we're not giving out five packs and going, yay, heroin, to our clients, <laughs> do we? You know, and I, I just kind of frustrating that there's a view that that's how we would work. It's not like that at all. It is done that no drugs are safe. And if you've got uh, MDMA, we're gonna, I would start my, I would say to the person, so your test result has indicated that you've got MDMA and our chemists haven't been able to find any other chemical in that result. Uh, so that seems like it's MDMA only and that this is 200 milligrams of MDMA. And we'd have a little laminated card with dosage guidelines. And I'd say to them, do you know how much would you normally take? Uh, and then we would have a discussion about dosage and say to the person that actually that's quite high and you know, for your, how much do you weigh? And we'd have a body weight discussion. I'd then say to them um, things like, what would be what would what would you normally do to stay safe when you use ecstasy? That would be how I'd start, and then they'd say, oh, I don't. I'd make sure I drink enough water and I uh, rest, and I, I'd find out what they do, and then go build from there. And they, some of them come out with just perfect. You know, they know their stuff. They've really been researching it, so you can pitch it at a higher level. If that was the case, I'd give them very advanced harm reduction advice because I think they're a bit clever. If they really don't know anything, they're very young and naive. Then I could pitch it quite simply and and make the advice much more targeted. Um, one of the cases that I will mention is a, a result, sample result that I got, which was a pure plaster of Paris, that no drugs detected. It's a pretty simple result, right? S surprise, you've got no drugs. Um, but when, as I was doing this, uh, as we started chatting, one of the questions we asked them is, have you actually taken the drug that you've provided us with? Have you already taken some of this sample? And this person says yes. And I said, and, ha and was the result did anything happen as out of the ordinary? Yes, I had a seizure. I'm looking at it going plaster of Paris. Um, you had a seizure. I said, could tell me more about that? Like there's this, a young woman with her three friends. And I said, tell me about this seizure. What happened about that? And so she said, oh, well, last night I took it and I was the only one who took it. Half an hour later, dropped on the ground. And she said, I don't know what happened. My eyes rolled back in my head. Uh, her friends said, yeah, we freaked out. We wanted her to go to medical. She refused to go to medical. And then she recovered after 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and I said, okay, have you got, this is before I've given her result. Uh, and then I said, um, have you got any other, other health problems or anything like that? Oh yeah, I've got multiple sclerosis. So, uh, can you tell me a bit about that? When, when did you get diagnosed with that? Because she's quite young, she's only about 18 or 19. When did you get diagnosed? She'd been diagnosed when she was about 15 or so. And I said, do you know what type? And she said, no, not really. The doctor said it was the neurological type. I'm like, so, okay, do you, do you see your doctor? She seemed very unaware. And I said, do you see your doctor? She said, no, I hate him. <laughs> she said, I haven't seen him for years. Okay, right. So then when we got to result time, I had to say, I said, oh, well, the results come back that there's actually no active ingredients and that that's plaster of Paris. And she was shocked. You can imagine the shock uh, for her and her friends were because they believed that she'd taken a dodgy chemical when actually it wasn't that at all. And so the intervention became, 
I think you need to go and see a doctor that you know there's probably this is, might be related to your MS rather than the drugs and you know in a festival environment people aren't eating well they're not drinking lots of water they're staying away you know there's all of the like I said I, I was there working it's a stressful harsh environment so people sleeping in very uncomfortable tents I had a lovely accommodation um, it's a harsh environment and so we ended up having this really interesting health discussion with her and and encouraging her to go back to her GP encouraging her to talk to her doctor about her drug use as well if she's got MS and she's gonna take ecstasy are you comfortable talking to a doctor about that how would you do that and it just the you know the conversation went in a direction you just didn't really expect that it would go in there's a few more pretty photographs. Uh, this is, um, the chemist detected some blotter being sold as N-bone, which coming from Australia, I wasn't surprised, but they didn't see much N-bone over there. Like, so they were quite interested when I was like, in Australia, this is our big problem actually, is N-bone in blotter or in tablets, and also a DO substance, DOI or DOB, one of those psychedelic phenethylamines as well. Um, so this one, this alert went out uh, on Twitter uh, pretty quickly and did the rounds and then I um, found this on the social media afterwards this is on Facebook this is a, a fella who had uh, after the festival was over posted this that he had taken what he was told was LSD and took three tabs which later thanks to the loop turned out to be n uh, but too late for him unfortunately he ended up overdosing and in medical and becoming seriously ill so, uh, you know, it's a shame that he didn't get the alert sooner. It's a shame he didn't bring his tabs in for testing himself as well. But uh, it does show that, you know, one of the, you know, another example of how early morning t drug checking, drug testing services can actually prevent people. Because I'm sure if this guy knew uh, what was in it, he probably wouldn't have done that. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I'll squeeze in one more story. Oh, so this is one of the pentalone. So Fiona mentioned the N-ethyl pentalone, and this was like, from the first day, the uh, N-ethyl pentalone cases were coming in, and as the days went on, the numbers sort of built up a little bit. And that was because, as Fiona mentioned, the half-life is quite long. Um, N-ethyl pentalone looks and smells just like MGMA, and so it had been most of it, that someone had been walking around the campsite selling it, basically, as powdered MGMA. Um, uh, Active doses may be 30 milligrams of N-ethylpentylone, whereas people were assuming it's MDMA taking 100 milligram doses at a time. So that's a large dose on its own. But pentylone initially has a strong stimulant effect, which is actually quite short acting, and then wears off within an hour or so, leaving this residual insomnia. But because it's the initial part is short acting, people redose. And each extra dose people take extends the insomnia by six to eight hours so people take it like MDMA where they might take hundred milligrams and every you know three or four times across a night then they can they will be awake for two or three days so on the first couple of days we saw a few people coming in who were just had just taken some so they were just at the beginning and not that concerned a bit like oh no I'll be right and we were concerned about them, but they obviously weren't only still early into it. We don't know how long they're going to stay awake for. So for those cases, we'd actually provide them with a loop card and write n pentalone on it and explain to them that if you're feeling uncomfortable later on, please come back. Um, and if you are needing help to sleep or feeling paranoid, then you can come to the medical and actually show them the little card because it tells it shows them that, that you've been to see us and that we can have an idea about what you might have taken, how we might treat you. But... Um, I'll just mention one of the cases that I had a pentaline case on the Sunday. So we had, uh, I had a group of four come in and two girls had, they'd brought a sample of what they thought was MGMA in and they brought it in because they'd taken it two days earlier and had ended up in medical for about 12 hours or so. So this was now the day after that. So they'd recovered, but they still had five grams of it in their possession and wanted to know what it was. So and I was giving them the result that it was n pentalone. So we had an n pentalone protocol around how that result was delivered. It was delivered with one of our really senior workers. It was uh, partly to help the person recognise that this is kind of serious. This is not just any other result that we're giving out here. Uh, so we would make it, they would realise that it's a bit of a big deal. Uh, but we went through it with these girls. They'd taken what they thought it was pen, uh, the pentalone, they'd purchased it off-site 
uh, strangely, they'd bought it into the festival, they'd bought it from their dealer at home, which was firstly interesting and sparked a big conversation around a, they were going to have a chat with their dealer. They also knew other friends back in their hometown who had purchased some off that person as well, who still had, they still had some in their possession at home as well. Um, the girls had had, uh, one of them had taken it and taken some MDMA as well. She described as feeling sick like she needed to vomit but she couldn't and so uncomfortable about not being able to vomit that that's why she went to the medical tent. Um, her friend had paranoia, her friend had become really anxious and had persecutory paranoia and thought that people were following them and chasing them around. So they both had pretty stereotypical symptoms. Um, once we gave them the result and had a big discussion about that, they were obviously really concerned because they'd been through medical. Uh, they also were really happy to hand it over as well. So they, there was five grams of pentaline and ethyl pentaline that they gave me for destruction, which I was really chuffed about. It was a very happy day uh, for that. They were very keen to get rid of it, obviously, and also um, keen to ring their friends. And we ended up having a discussion about are your friend, when would your friends be taking it back home? And they think maybe now it's the weekend. So they're like, okay, we're going to start phoning people back home and letting them know, uh, don't take the stuff that they'd bought in their hometown. So again, a really interesting one. Uh, and we like five grams of N-ethylpentylone is enough to put a whole bunch of people in medical. If you think about 30 milligram doses and how long people stay awake for, just that dose on its own in circulation at a festival's got medical run off their feet. So I think that's all I'm probably going to say. We're nearly out of time. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, give you a few little stories on the ground. Here's a few little, uh, this is from Twitter as well afterwards of people saying how, spoke to a lovely woman who is knowledgeable and you actually learn something. I can't stop thinking about all the things she told me. Uh, I found lots of young people, as Fiona mentioned, had never spoken to a professional about their drug use before. We did at some point have to pull people up a bit and say, you've got to go now because they'd say, I've got one more question. Is it true that, um, uh, you know, with all the myths they'd ever heard, and they had this experience of like, wow, this is, I can ask you anything. And they, they would often want to take us way off into some other directions as well, uh, which was awesome. You could just see how thankful people were for it and how uh, initially a bit uh, a bit nervous people were coming in. It's a lot of people, it was their first time, uh, but how quickly they'd warm up to it, uh, to the point that we could have some really interesting discussions. I also felt that we had some really, I mean, I'm, I just feel like I'm getting older. Some of them looked so young, they were so little, and I couldn't help but thinking your parents, like, uh, and thinking of the parents who've got young people at festivals like that, and how nerve wracking it must be, knowing what is in circulation, and how our drug market here in Australia, as you all know, is getting more and more dangerous all the time, and the responsibility in having a young person in front of you who is potentially gonna make a dumb decision, and how it is that we can shape that is uh, actually kind of amazing. So really, um, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I expected to, to, that it would be a useful thing, but I didn't expect just how uh, the punters took it. Um, and I've really found it, for everyone who's worked in need on syringe program, just like NSP. And I know I've worked in NSP and counselling roles. Counselling roles, you sometimes don't always get the truth. You sometimes get what probation and parole child safety want to hear. Needle and syringe programs, or you get honesty, right? If you've, if you've all done it, you get this raw kind of honesty that people trust you more than other types of treatment settings. And that was the feeling at the, at the loop as well, that you get this really um, uh, trust built really quickly from people. So that's the close to the finale, I think. Um, it's all shiny and beautiful, but it, actually it's a mud pit underneath all that, so don't be fooled by... <laughs> by all of that. So I think that's all we've got time for. Um, do we have any questions or any time for questions? There was one quick question online about what is done with the demographic data collected by um, your volunteers. Uh, so we will be reaching out to people who are interested in the work one in regards to the sniffer dogs. So I just had a question in regards to the sniffer dogs and the impact that they were having and was there um, any increased kind of overdose because people were taking the, the drugs? 
so they weren't getting caught. Yeah, I know that we've just there's a paper just about to be published here in Australia uh, with Monica Barrett and colleagues that have sampled a whole bunch of festival goers in Australia who found and that that study is very interesting because it found amongst people going to festivals, uh, ninety something percent had would did not change their behaviour based on the dogs. I've got a feeling that since we've had them here in Australia for so long, I think people are quite aware that they're way less effective than people believe they are. I'm a dog person, right? And I was fascinated watching the dogs. I'm, I, my dog is extremely well trained at home, so I know how dogs work. And watching the, me watching the dogs, I didn't think that they were really capable of detecting much. Um, I think sniffer dogs work much better in a controlled environment, like at an airport, whereas out in a festival, I mean, there is crazy people everywhere, there's smells, there's wind. I know wind will distract a dog. Uh, so I just was looking at it going, I don't think that's very effective really in watching it. So I think that the more exposure people going to festivals have had to dogs, the, maybe the less impact they have at all because people just think it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about the role of social workers, but I think that was kind of answered in the fact that all the health professionals providing the harm reduction response are trained and qualified. Yeah, so that's one of the loops of approaches is that only people who are qualified uh, do those roles. They're, it's a really serious health intervention and it's a, you've got to really know how to do an assessment. So everybody involved is either an alcohol and drugs worker, uh, we had pharmacy, we were very handy having pharmacists on board, a whole bunch of nurses, doctors. Uh, so it does take a, it's not a uh, simple intervention and it does take a fair bit of skill in getting, you've got to build rapport and get a history in 15 to 20 minutes of someone. So that takes a bit of skill. So I think that's uh, part of the loop success has been having really qualified people involved. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, I think that's it for questions, and we have run over time. So, thank you very much. Join me. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Amanda.